Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. I hope this episode helps you identify and break your next growth barrier. And if you enjoy it, subscribe to my YouTube channel and you'll never miss a thing. Hey, whether it's staffing, budget, volunteers, or one of the many things that hold back churches, overcoming growth barriers is the key to progress. And if you're ready to break your next barrier, the Art of Leadership Academy is for you. Inside, you'll get access to all my on-demand church leadership courses, team trainings, coaching calls, but more importantly, you'll join a network of 1,500 high-capacity church leaders. Some will be right where you're at and some a little bit ahead, but everybody in the group is committed to leading a healthier, growing church and supporting each other. So if you want to fuel your mission, not just by consuming information, but by pairing it with people who will both challenge and support you, today's the day. You can learn more and start making progress by visiting theartofleadershipacademy.com. And also check out He Gets Us. Churches across the country are using resources from the He Gets Us campaign to give people new and creative ways to share Jesus' message of radical love. Go to hegetsuspartners.com slash carry, and you can sign up to get free resources like discussion guides, prayer guides, reading plans, and more. Now to today's episode. Mark, it's good to have you back. Welcome. Yeah, great to be back again. I always look forward to these conversations, and I want to go out on a limb here, and just because there seems to be a little bit of calm compared to all the chaos we've had over the last three years, and there's been a lot of chaos, as we've talked about, Um, and I talk to a lot of leaders, they're feeling optimistic and hopeful for a new year, the whole deal. Is that even remotely accurate or delusional, (laughs) or are we in the eye of a hurricane, or like, what is going on here? Yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, I think there is more change to come, and <laughs> uh, yeah. so is the short answer. Um, I think I think what we've become attuned to in the last couple of years is a couple of things. One is lots of, particularly in North America, lots of cultural war issues which play out across social media and in the news. And perhaps there's been feels like that's dropped off a little bit, particularly in the US with the midterms past. Um, the midterms but, were remarkably stable. Like yes. Um, but uh, the other thing is also with COVID, with restrictions and stuff like that, you know, the world seems to be sort of learning to live with it. Um, obviously, China is an exception to that. So I think we can miss some of the bigger changes that are actually happening. And I think if you, if you think about um, culture war and a lot of how politics has been, it's been a lot of sound and fury, a lot of noise, whereas politics traditionally is actually about changing the very structure of things. And I think actually what's happening at the moment is there's huge structural changes which are going to have more effect than perhaps cultural war issues. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, if you look at the economic model of the world, uh, there's tremendous pressure upon it at the moment. And uh, we're still paying, you know, the, the stimulus that, you know, first sort of began in 2008 with the global financial crisis and then was used again um, when the pandemic hits. That's the tool that is continued to be used around things like energy now. And there's only so long you can release stimulus and print money without things like inflation going up. And uh, the rise of interest rates um, is going to change the world. So the economic model, <laughs> but there was a, I, heard, I think it was James Forsyth, the British um, journalist, talked about we've been living for 30 years in what he called a nice world, nice standing for no inflation, constant expansion. So, you know, we're looking for a world where it's going to be, I think, particularly uh, with the energy challenges that we have, that's not only about the environment, but also about Ukraine, but also just energy, the the model of the world that we've lived in, where everything works well and there's relative peace is being significantly changed. So, for example, the British government just put an estimate that in the next two years, the standard of living in Britain is going to drop by 7.5%. Um, you know, you're going to see this in Europe. Um, you know, Europe sort of seems to have dealt with perhaps some of the challenges coming this winter. However, that's this winter, um, you know, and I think that we've entered into a new stage, particularly with it happened and people sort of looked at it for a moment, but then moved on. But I think it's a, it's like a Rubicon that's been crossed, which was the destruction of Nord Stream 2, the gas pipeline uh, into into Europe from Russia. Whoever did that, the, the yeah. main suspect seems to be... Um, uh, uh, you know, Russia in a lot of people's minds. But that changed the game because now people are attacking the very infrastructure of the global network in which we live very quietly. Countries like yours and mine are sending out ships to secure our internet cables and make sure they're okay. Uh, 
Um, you know, and so I, I think that we're seeing huge economic challenges coming down the line, a reshaping of the global order. And you've got players now like China and Russia and, and others, Iran, who are not playing by the rules that gave us the world that we had for the last 30 years. So I think we're in for a sustained period of change that's possibly in the decades. Yeah, you see, I mean, this is releasing. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. So, Sorry, I, know, I always smile. I, always, I feel bad. I, <laughs> I, I say these things and then smile, but it's more like I realize, yeah. <laughs> I'm not no, laughing but at this is this yeah. is real stuff. I mean, this is releasing in early 2023. We're recording it in late 2022, and literally today, while we're recording, Russia is just trying to annihilate the power grid and the water grid in Ukraine. And if you can't take a city, just try to destroy the people by cutting that off. And I can see that being more of a threat. Another very real thing is, you know, the the housing market in the U.S. and Canada. Yes. Same thing in Australia. Went through the yeah. roof over the last two years. Peaked in March of 22 and has been on a downward slide. And like a, a meaningful double-digit percentage of Canadians who have mortgages are now at what they call the trigger point where they're no longer paying principal. They're only paying interest. And so you look at that and I'm like, yeah, that, that, I remember that in my parents' lifetime, but that's never really, like, I remember my first mortgage was 8% and we thought we got a great rate compared to what our parents used to complain about. So, you know, when it was like interest rates were at 1%, 3%, I'm like, yeah, this is crazy. It's not going to last. But there's a whole generation coming up going, well, we could afford a million dollar home on 2%, but we can't at 4%. And yes. so that kind of dislocation, but deeper than that. Yeah. And I think there's going to be a lot, of, like it's, we're so used to COVID happening, you know, like say when Trump won the election, it was a shock, you know, and yeah. when COVID happened and the world shut down, it was a very rapid shock. Um, I think what we're seeing now is going to be this slow shaving off of things. So exactly what you're saying, I'm paying more on my mortgage. Um, we had this thing where a lot of people saved money during the pandemic. So now they're spending on services and, and vacations, but, Airline prices are going to are going up and going to go continue to go up because jet fuel is super expensive and it's not going to get any cheaper anytime soon. Um, plus, you've also got a lot of what people people have spent a lot of that household savings that happened during the pandemic and they continue to live in that lifestyle, but now it's on debt. So, what a lot of people think about with interest rates and inflation, sorry, and it, yeah, interest rates is housing debt, but they don't think about credit card debt. So, for a lot of emerging Gen Z or Gen Z or millennials. They are increasingly walking into a significant amount of debt. So there's a finite point that this starts to run out and as everything starts to come together. And, and the other thing I would say in the midst of this is we have to increasingly start to look at the very real possibility of increased geopolitical conflict. Um, Russia is not just going, you know, I think I pray and hope that, that there is a peaceful resolution to the war. But I think that, you know, it's not like Putin's going to go, oh, well, gave it a try. The more that Ukraine pushes and uh, Russia back, the increased chance of Russia doing something quite destructive. But for me, I think the real thing, which you know, your country and I is both feeling at the moment, is the increased assertiveness of China in the world, and the increased possibility of a conflict um, breaking out. Uh, uh, you know, our our former prime minister, who is a uh, Kevin Rudd, who's a China expert, speaks Mandarin, has sat with Xi Jinping. Uh, did his Oxford PhD on, you know, on Xi Jinping's rise, you know, just said in our newspaper, we've got a five-year window to avert war with China. Um, so, you know, this is this is going to have a huge effect. And I think like China I think invading that, Australia or what? Uh, I think Taiwan. The issue is, Taiwan. sorry, Taiwan. I said, I should clarify that. Yeah, China taking Taiwan in the next five years, which will have incredible economic and technological effects on the world. And that's not even talking about the fact that that affects uh, South Korea, that affects North Korea, that affects Japan, that affects Thailand, uh, sorry, Philippines, uh, Singapore, Malaysia. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's something that is going to have huge effects, you know. And I sort of hinted at this uh, in, I think, our last conversation, or perhaps a little bit more clear, that in a world where you can see countries like China and India and other countries possibly in conflicts, and, and what does that mean at a level when, uh, people have been looking, particularly in the church, around issues of race, uh, 
But issues of nationalism we've also been looking at. But the way that, say, people have been looking at, particularly the US, is our US nationalism. What happens when you've got a multicultural church and you've got people in that church who are from different nationalist backgrounds clashing? And I think this is going to become an increasing issue. So, you know, there are people, churches, say, you know, there might be a church in, in Canada and there's a clash, um, you know, between two nations on the other side of the world. And it may have nothing to do with Canada, but you're like trying to work out how to do peace between these different groups. So a more conflicted and contested world is where we're heading. And the implications of that are, are manifold. But, but just, just one sort of final point on the, um, what you mentioned about inflation and interest rates. I think there are countries like, like a country like Argentina, which has struggled with, with inflation and, and debt defaults and stuff for many years. But countries like Northern Europe, a lot of people in North America, countries like Australia and New Zealand have never faced this. You've got a generation mm. who've never faced this. So their, their model of life is that things is just going to keep, options are going to keep increasing. The economy is going to keep growing. Mm. Um, progress is going to keep going. And I think one thing we're going to see is an increased a rise of nihilism and a sense of broken dreams. Um, and so, but I think there's an evangelistic and a pastoral opportunity in that as some of these ideologies and myths fall and a different world emerges. So I want to get into uh, nihilism and the changing world order, but I got to just pause here because we're 10 minutes in. And there's, there is like this delusional belief because I can, you know, I can go to the grocery store today, buy what I want to buy, come home, sleep in my nice warm bed, undisrupted, and kind of put my head under the pillow and go, la, 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 this is not happening, not happening, which honestly, I must say, I have to check that impulse inside me. Um, how do you sleep at night? knowing all this, researching this. And because I think there are a lot of pastors, a lot of leaders listening who would say, I just want to pretend this stuff isn't happening. Yeah, yeah. The, the way I sleep at night is, um, <laughs> is I actually think, in, so, so well, the question I ask myself is, what do I live for? Mm. You know, do I live for the project of the developed world where my hope and dreams are in better malls and cheaper interest rates and... Um, more options and and more variety on Netflix, and actually, I actually think like it, one of the challenges that I've I've had here in Melbourne, and it's a strange challenge because it's actually quite a pleasant challenge on some ways, is I've lived in you know the world's most livable city, Vancouver and Melbourne, and, and Vienna have fought for that for a while, uh-huh. and and what you're fighting here is a fantastic quality of living. Now I love that and it, and benefit from it, so I don't want to like make it some terrible thing I'm living through, but I also see the spiritual cost of that. It means people don't have to think about God. They can live insulated and they can, they can deny, you know, uh, the spiritual realities of life. So, so part of me is I think when you have a, like a prophetic um, view of life where you can see that God has tremendous, um, you know, like holiness and righteousness that he calls us to, um, you know, we're living for the kingdom. We're living for eternity. We're not just living for mm. the, in the project of here and now. So in some ways, I see a world where there's great, you know, I think often what the, the West has done is looked at this, say, the church in the South and gone, oh, you know, we can see the disparity there. A lot of that is purely because there are more challenges in the global South and perhaps as more challenges and expectations fall in, in, in the developed world, I think perhaps the church could move into a healthier place and we could see a more genuine discipleship. Mm. Yeah. So and really, you have I'm, to- I'm spiritually hopeful is the weird thing I'm saying. Yeah, it is. It is good. And I think we all know that. But I think if I really had to disentangle myself from what am I truly living for, that's a much deeper question. So this gets into your new book, which we've hinted at before, but it's the first time we talked since it's been out. And I loved reading it. Um, You have so much insight into what's going on, but also to distilling it in a way that I think really helps us figure out what to do in the midst of it. But you talk about a non-anxious presence, quoting, it's Edwin Freeman, I believe. And on your podcast, you've talked a lot, which I recommend to everybody. Listen to the Rebuilders podcast. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. You've talked for a couple of years now about the gray zone. Can you describe what the gray zone is and what does it mean for leaders leading through it right now? Mm -hmm. So in some ways, what we've been talking about is, is the gray zone. And I, and I wanted a, a term to capture not just what was happening intellectually, but also the feeling of what it is to lead and live in this moment. 
And I realized that in many ways, when we look back at history and you try and look back at other periods, you may look back to the Great Awakenings, you can look to the early church, you can look to the medieval period, all of these eras, and I just named them, have sort of like containers that we put over them, the medieval period, the Victorian era, um, the Enlightenment. Um, and so eras are as a concept where we give a, a name to it and often we do that to capture the thoughts, the feelings, the experiences. There tends to be a kind of order which dominates politically in, in a particular period. And I was trying to think about well, what's the next one we're moving into And what I began to realize was we're not actually fully in one. We're leaving the previous era. We can see something beginning. You know, you look, I don't know if you see on, 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 um, you know, Twitter or Instagram, these Boston dynamics videos of the robotic dogs, you know, come up and, and it's sort of like, okay, I can see that they're not walking around in my neighborhood yet, but I know, I know they're coming. (laughs) Um, so it's like you can see the future growing and it's shape starting to take shape. And you can see things passing. Um, you know, I just, it's our state election here on Saturday. And I was looking through a lot of the candidates. And wow, it's a lot more radical and polarized than in the past. You know, hmm. the old days of sort of centrists and people who just wanted to be here for the local, you know, because they're in the local Rotary Club, it's changing. So a past world is passing, a new world is emerging, but we're in between. So it's actually an overlap where some of the features of the previous era are here and some of the features of the emerging era are here. But it's very confusing. There's no markers. So we're in the in the no man's land between the two trenches of the two eras. And that's a strange and confusing place to live in. And I think that's actually what is the felt uh, sense that so many leaders have. Like, what is this place? It's strange. I'm trying to lead here. It's It's an unusual place to exist. Yeah, and you you hint at that in your book, or you write about it in your book too. That that we probably like civilizations come and go, right? Like the Roman Empire is no more. The medieval era is no more. The feudal era is no more. Well, you can argue it exists in different forms, but as we know it historically, are we seeing an empire decline? And I'm most of the audience for this podcast is American. So speak directly to that. Is the American empire in decline? What What is going on? Because I think you're right. We're at a hinge point, a crack in history. Mm. I think that um, it's a really interesting question. So I think, you know, absolutely the Anglo-American empire has defined the last couple of centuries and perhaps there was a British component at the beginning and now there's an American component and that's what's defined the world. The reason we have globalization is because the American Navy has secured the seaports, uh, so the sea lanes of the world and people can trade. And um, you know, there's a genuine sense that people feel in the world that perhaps things are changing. You know, I saw a video, someone walked through like a Macy's or something uh, in, in North America and everything like being featured was like Korean or Japanese. And, like here's BTS and here's this anime and, you know, here's this Nordic noir series or something. And there is this sense that the world has America facilitated globalization, but then also globalization is sort of taking America's prime space in the world in terms of influence. And in many ways, you know, people now look at America's influence in the world as perhaps sort of some of the internal um, conflict is sort of spreading outwards. Um, I I still think it's interesting. There's a lot still up in play. Like if it's not America, who is it is a really interesting question. And the obvious sort of, you know, thing posited is, is it China? But then China has tremendous problems interior, you know, in its own interior. But I think the sense around civilizational decline is often if you look at a, a sort of theory of civilizational decline, there's also something happening. There was a, a medieval uh, Arabic scholar called Ibn Khaldun who sort of one of the first people to articulate civilizational decline. And they said almost generations, you know, you have like a generation who builds it, a generation who then maintains it, a generation who assumes it, and then a generation who becomes entitled about it. So, you know, you have this sense that we stand on the shoulders of giants who went previous. And I think what the sense you get in the US and and perhaps in much of the developed world or the West, let's say, is that you've now got a generation who just assumes this is all normal and they don't have to sacrifice to build it. And often that's the point where civilizations, despite their strength, and America has incredible natural resources going for it, incredible seaports, rivers, food bowls. Um, but there's a sense like, you know, is are we sort of like, um, you know, at a generation which entitlement has now meant that it's sort of internally uh, corrupting. Mm. 
Can we break that down a little bit more? I know you broke it down mm-hmm. on your podcast, but the is it four or five generations? Because there's a generation that spends it into bankruptcy too. I mean, look at yes. the Vanderbilts yes. or you know the Rock. Yes. Well, not quite the Rockefellers, but mm-hmm. yeah, that's really interesting to think about. Because even Remembrance Day for me um, mm-hmm. is about something my grandfather sacrificed, not something my father or I did. Now I know there's a lot of active military personnel who have been employed. Mm-hmm an actual battle who are listening to this. So I'm, I'm not disparaging that, but it's not like we have been in this global conflict that involved most of us in our lifetime. Yeah. yeah. So talk about that. Well, I think yeah, I, I find two, in, two yeah. interesting ways to look at it. So, you know, I, I definitely see that I think it's happening in the world. Like we talked about debt and the fact that this this lifestyle, you know, it's, in some ways you can look at immigrant families that are a little bit like this. You have the immigrants who move to a new country, they work night shift, and then the kids have this great life. And and then, but then they assume it and perhaps go into debt um, because they're not working for that life. You see that civilizationally. So I think that's definitely happening uh, in the West and particularly narcissism you know, almost this Epicureanism, hedonism, you know, all these values where we're seeing ourselves as the center of it and we're not willing to sacrifice. But also I find it interestingly and provocative to think about it in terms of churches and Christian organizations. Uh, you know, a lot of what we, we, we live in is actually built on the previous generation's giving and volunteerism. And, you know, I think we're going to move to a point soon in the church where you've got the baby boomer generation, often sometimes maligned, but also provide an incredible amount of volunteerism, institution building. And I think we assume a lot of what they've given us. And, and, and you know, are we going to get to the point where what we see happening in, say, the Western civilization is also happening a lot of our Christian organizations. There's a lot of entitlement, assumption, and almost, yeah, that debt spending it into bankruptcy through just not volunteering and not sacrificing for the greater good. Mm. So the, the five generations are... you. Can you just walk it through one more time? I'm just fascinated by that. Yeah, idea. and th- and this is sort of my my summation of a number of different of yeah. these thinkers. But I think I think you have a first generation who sort of sacrifices for it. They're like the pioneers. Um, they go out and, and build something out of nothing. You've then got those who are still in relationship with the first generation of pioneers, so they have a sense that they want to continue it. So often they're the ones who maintain it. They follow the rules, you know, they do it. It's like you mentioned Remembrance Day. They're, their fathers yeah. served, so they, they remember them. The next generation is at this point where they just assume this is normality. So there's a sense of what, what defines them is entitlement. Perhaps they're the first generation and past now. Uh, and then I think you have another generation who moves into some form of corruption, be it debt um, or, uh, you know, moral uh, or, or injustice, you know, they're, they're so far from the beginnings of it. You know, they've been corrupted by the entitlement. And then you have a last generation which lives in the ruins and, and looks back, you know. So, you know, you, you think about, I was just in Edinburgh and it's fascinating. On, on the hill in Edinburgh, you've got this sort of like, they built these almost like the Athenian ruins. And this is their way in the enlightenment of like looking back to the greatness of the Greco-Roman world. And they're trying to recapture that. There's a mourning of something lost. And there's a lot of that now, like a lot of dystopian science fiction is a kind of mourning about the progressive future that hasn't arrived technologically. Well, you see that in our films. I mean, it's even everybody shooting things darker. We were watching the series last night and it's like, literally the cinematography is so dark, you can barely make out the characters. And we have a decent, TV, almost everything's dystopian or villainous. And it's been that way for a couple of decades. Mm. What is underneath that in your view? I, I think it's the failing Western dream. What's really interesting, if you look at if you look at statistics comparing how Western young people see the world and young people in Asia, young people in Asia are much more uh, optimistic about the future. And even if you look at sort of um, Asian young people's interaction with technology, it's a lot less wary. There's an embrace of technology and seeing things changing. So I think I think what it is 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 a sense that perhaps there were better days in the past. You know, I, mm. I, I talk to people in my daughter's generation, my daughter's 14, there's a sense that they they yearn for the 90s. <laughs> um, that, <laughs> yeah. that, you know, it, it's, it's like nostalgia. You look at Stranger Things. Is that the show, Stranger Things? Yeah. Like, yeah. There's this looking back to the 80s, the 90s, this time before, you know, social media and isolation. You know, it's almost like a pre 9-11 world a lot of emerging generations are looking for. So I think that nostalgia is is a mourning 
um, that they, they realize their future is not going to be as good um, as previous generations. And there's always, you know, like a rosy colored look at the past, but um, I think that's, that's indicative. Mm. Yeah. You mentioned that um, in an era of a gray zone, there's no rules or the rules keep changing. Can you give us some examples of rules that may be applied as recently as the nineties or early two thousands that don't apply anymore and where this may be going? Cause that makes it really confusing for leaders, which is why it's so easy to stick your head in the sand and just pretend it's business as usual when it's not. Yeah. Well, if you, if you think about, um, you know, computers operating systems, um, you know, you've got two big ones in the world, sort of Apple and, and sort of PC, uh, they, they run on a set of rules, protocols, and it's the same as cultures. Cultures have certain kinds of protocols. There are uh, things that you may do in your in your culture and you don't realise until you go to another culture that's a protocol you all run on. And it enables people to have trust, social trust. It enables people to follow particular social sort of taboos. Um, and, and what happens in a grey zone is that all gets mixed up. So it's like you're trying to run multiple different things on PC and, and, and Mac and trying to plug them all in and there's computer viruses and so, you know, for example, what's happened is a lot of the past, if you go back sort of 20 years, was around broadcast media. You had, mm-hmm. uh, you know, one per, you know, like a, everyone in the country watching a few shows, everyone saw the same movies. Now you think about it, there's like, instead of like 10 movies that everyone sees, there's, you know, 50,000 movies that a handful of people see. And so what that means is you don't have agreement on social issues. Um, so a lot of culture war is really a, a symptom of that those rules are broken down. So talk about political correctness is an attempt to try and establish a new set of social rules. Um, but then there's debate and context over them. Then you throw in multiculturalism, you throw in a global uh, uh, thing. So classic example, I know this is a little bit later, but the World Cup's on at the moment. And you have um, uh, you know, European nations who wanted to wear a particular armband. There's one love thing with uh, with a uh, uh, campaign with a, with a rainbow flag, and Qatar is like no. And um, you've got this clash in something like FIFA, the World Federation of Football, where all of a sudden you've got an increased activism because people want to establish a new set of rules. But they're trying to now do that in Islam in the Islamic world surrounded by nations who don't agree with those Western set of rules. And, that, you know, so all of a sudden stuff starts to break down when you don't have the same protocols that you're operating on. And that's not just true of the World Cup. That's true in your church. And because mm-hmm. we don't have a broadcast media, you've got people living in internet silos where they can be fooled that, oh, everyone believes the new rules as I believe them, but that's just the people who are algorithmically being surrounded by you by the algorithms of the network. So, in some ways, it's sort of a move to a kind of babel in terms of ethics and morals and, and rules. Well, and I think you're right. It works in silos, like vertically, but it also works horizontally in terms of demographics. Boomers versus Xers versus Millennials versus Z and now Alpha underneath that. And I think that's a nice segue into the Overton window, which you mentioned. And it's, it's something, you know, I'd heard a few times in my life, but it seems to be popping up. Can you define what the Overton window is and then how that is at work in our culture right now? Yeah. So the Overton window was, um, I can't remember, I think it was, the guy was called Overton. Um, I think he was a poly, so. policy yeah. <laughs> analyst. And he basically talked about the way that an idea can go, like a, he was he was using it to say, if we introduce a policy that could be unthinkable, um, what's the point where that becomes acceptable and integrated into the culture? So he talked about that, you know, an idea is introduced, it's rejected, but then a few people accept it. And then if effectively public opinion swings and it goes through this process where something unaccepted, unacceptable, um, then moves uh, into the acceptable. Um, so that's happened, you know. So, for example, gay marriage um, in many Western countries was, you know, you had people like Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama um, publicly speaking against it. And then only a few years later, if you spoke against it, you'd almost, you know, sort of be, um, you know, publicly sanctioned. Um, so that's an example of something moving through the Overton window. I think we're in a new place now where we're in absolute um, high-speed Overton window because of that silos that we just spoke about. And it's interesting too, like I remember reading about um, a, a lady, I think it was about 2013, 2014, she was Southern Baptist in Texas and she went from zero interest in Islam 
and then six weeks later had become had pledged allegiance to ISIS. And this all happened because of online radicalization. So we're in a world where the Overton window is spinning at a hyper speed because you can go into a form of radicalization online because of algorithms and just the immersive nature of the internet. Um, so I think the pandemic, everyone sort of locked down on phones, saw all kinds of radicalizations everywhere happening at once. Some might be to all of a sudden take up a new fitness uh, you know, <laughs> program for your life. Others are political, others are ideological. So what we're seeing is the Overton window going at a, a rapid rate. Um, you know, so you're seeing now, I mean, I was just reading about some of the sort of new frontiers in philosophy and the new things. So there's a, you know, everyone's sort of dealing with, you know, woke stuff at the moment, talking about that. Already, if you look at what's happening in academia, people are moving beyond that. And there's a critique of the woke stuff saying that they're looking at these different levels of oppression, but the one that they're not seeing is human, non-human. So for example, in an oil spill, um, no one's asked about the agency of the oil and the metal structures and, you know, so, so things I'm like, oh my goodness, okay. this is so bizarre. But, but, you know, like I'm, I'm finding stuff I'm saying like in three years time, you know, like say something like polyamory, um, you know, we just saw the B, the BTX thing. And all of a sudden, you know, you realize that you've got a, a company, uh, sorry, the um, FTX thing where you've got a company, you know, with a bring run, two companies dealing with each other and all the people are in a sort of group relationship. And this is becoming more and more in certain areas. The Overton windows passed on that uh, very quickly. So we're in a, a, a sort of gray zone Overton window hyperspeed. Well, and by the way, I did a quick Google search. Thank you, Wikipedia. Joseph Overton, an American policy analyst. So there you go. Um, but that makes it really hard to preach, particularly, you know, you've got a few decades in you. I've got a few decades in me. And that's one of the reasons what you would say very comfortably in 1999 is stuff like I, I was, it was a stupid BuzzFeed article that came up the other day, but it's like, you know, what nineties and two thousand sitcoms got wrong. And they're making fun of the stuff that we used to laugh at, you know, mm. 10 years ago, everybody mm. did. Now, some of that stuff needed to go, but some of it was like, mm. Oh, yeah, I guess people don't think that way anymore. So that makes communicating really challenging. How do you challenging? How do you navigate that? Because you're not just this thinker who writes books. You're the pastor of a church, of Red Church in Melbourne, a real church with real people that you show up at every week. How do you pastor through that? Well, I think what, what I realize is I'm in a New Testament scenario. You know, one of my heroes is is Leslie Newbegin, and he was trying to tell people in the '90s you know, the West is not what you think it is, you know, and he, you know, saw the West as an increasingly multicultural, pluralistic, um, you know, he wrote a book called The Gospel in a Pluralist um, Society. And, you know, I think that's it. I can have someone sitting in, in the audience who's an atheist. I can have someone who's a new ager. I can have someone who's a lapsed Catholic. I can have someone who's an Iranian Muslim who's open spiritually. So I have to engage in multiple things, you know, and I think Keller has been helpful on some of this in the sense of, you know, talking about in New York, you know, there's these different groups that you're preaching to. Um, so I actually find the New Testament is addressing different audiences, you know, all the time. There's, there's Jews, there's sort of Greek speaking Jews, there's, there's, there's complete sort of pagans. Um, so I think it's, it's a fantastic um, way to keep us on our toes and engaged. I think what we're going to be careful to is not to give ourselves just be in our little silo. Um, and you know, the thing I realized is I thought for ages on oh, Melbourne's just moving increasingly progressive and everyone who turns up is not a Christian is a, um, you know, sort of liberal progressive. When I began to discover like Gen Z, Z people turning up who were like super conservative, like more conservative than Christians. <laughs> so, you know, like, like it's all happening out there and, and I actually see that as an exciting challenge, um, which I think means we're doing missiology in, in the West. This is a bit of a leading question and feel free to disagree, but I imagine it's harder to deal with the Overton window changing as quickly as it does when you used to be the people who owned the Overton window. Do you know what I mean? Like Christians sort of set the standards for acceptability for generations. Now you can argue it was never really that way or whatever, but, but broad cultural strokes. I think you can make an argument that we kind of defined what was acceptable and what was not acceptable. And sometimes we didn't steward that particularly well. Mm. 
Do you think part of the frustration with the changing moral values is somehow related to control? I think, I think there's, a, there's a couple of things there. I think yeah. may, maybe also because as an Australian, you know, the first church in Australia was burnt down. <laughs> and, uh-huh. and, and there's a sense where, you know, Australia was trying to do a sort of, it was, you know, it was some of the most secular people in the British Empire, you know, uh, you had a lot of, you know, working work, sex workers, um, convicts and soldiers who were being punished. So there was always this sort of post-Christian thing to Australia. So maybe I don't feel that in the same way that perhaps people do in other places. Um, but I can, I can see the point. And, and I think that, I think there is a sense of, of, of not, I think there's a difference between losing control and losing power. Um, and, mm. and perhaps that partially it's not the loss of control of the Overton women, but it's the loss of the fact that you can have the power to control it. So there's a natural anxiety that comes up when we, we have a loss of control. So there's lots of places feeling that. But I think the most biggest pushback and where it moves into the realm of politics or trying to influence politics is when uh, you think we can get that back. So the strategy to win back the kingdom of God is to retake the Overton window. Part of how I see it is, um, you know, like the Overton window is going so fast, it's almost making a mockery of itself. And I find so many people um you know who are just like the world's gone mad like non-christians are very willing to have the conversation with you which begins as what on earth is going on my head is spinning how do you see this as a christian like i have that conversation often yeah you know, i still got a friend in europe same thing you know so i think that that the overton window spinning actually undermines the ideology of the day hmm. yeah and and that can explain the hyper politicalization of faith in the United States. We're going to take back the White House, take back the Supreme Court, take back the governorship. Um, mm. That grasping for power. Mm. Um, all of this leads us to anxiety. <laughs> As you say, people are rattled. Leaders are rattled. People are frustrated. Whether you're trying to get back to the way it used to be, trying mm. to forge a way forward, that takes us to, into the non-anxious anxious presence. Um you know, the latest stat I just got from Barna done in the fall of 2022 is it's not 42% of pastors are thinking of seriously leaving ministry now. It's dropped to 39%, which is still discouraging, right? Yeah. But a lot of us are thinking, hey, I'm just, I'm just going to check out. I'm not going to do this anymore. Mm. How do you find or cultivate a non-anxious presence in this mm. context, Mark? Mm. I was, I was thinking about this this week, actually, and, and, and I think that one thing I've noticed is on some ways, you know, like when I talk to people, so like, you know, do these podcasts and you get in discussions with people over the place. There's an element when I began talking about a lot of this, people looked at it ideologically. Okay, so there's this new idea coming up and how do we deal with this and what's my response apologetically to that or whatever. But what I'm noticing is I've spoken to people, where it really hurts is relationally. <laughs> And I think what's marked the last year is, yes, it's the pandemic. Yes, it's polarization. Yes, it's all this stuff. But when you ask someone about that, they'll go, yeah, my church got polarization has been a big thing and they'll talk about politics. But then they'll say, there was Fred, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and Fred was my friend. And, you know, he, he, he became like radicalized or he disagreed with me on this. And, and, and him and his wife and kids, they don't talk to us anymore. And I think that that's what I've noticed. So there's an element like I can throw out the, Here's what's happening cultural thing, which is a great explainer. But where this the, the rubber hits the road for so many leaders is relationally and families, friends. What happens when the people in the team you planted with, you know, like you get into conflict or turn on you. The issue of ghosting of like mm. John Tyson early on in the pandemic put up a, a tweet or something. He's like, you know, that term ghosting, which sort of comes from millennials in dating where all of a sudden someone just stops replying to, to you. But, you know, we saw, I think John put up something like saying something or rather like that happening in the church and and the amount of people I know who've experienced that, like we were so tight with those people, you know, like we we buried their mother, we married them, and then one day they just disappeared. So I I think... I, I want to make that that real thing, like like the, like almost this is a pastoral answer as much, mm. and 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 like I think in the midst of that, the the answer has to be a dependency and an intimacy with Jesus. And I think you know I look a lot more. I've got my cultural answer, but I think where I'm where I'm landing on this is biblically. 
um, you know, you're walking through this place where I think of the cross and Jesus has poured years into these, these 12 guys. That's, that's, that's his team and they disappear. <laughs> yeah. And, and what he must have felt like. Um, and, uh, uh, who was it? Um, uh, I've, I've got black on who said it, but I remember I just read a quote recently where they were saying that oh, it was R.T. Kendall, where he said one of the most painful things on the cross that that Jesus must have felt was misunderstood by those who he was closest to, and so I think that's the real place. So I think an increased dependency on Christ. There's a great Spurgeon quote he gave to his like young pastors. You know, had that book letters to young pastors or preachers or whatever where he said, you know, brothers, prepare your heart to be betrayed by some of your closest friends. We never get told that in seminary. That's not told in leadership Mm -hmm. books. But that is the lived reality of so many people I'm talking to over the last two years. And and that's just a turning to Jesus, you know, and and it's a garden of Gethsemane moment. But on the other side of that, you know, I think there's an increased spiritual authority. I think there's an increased dependency and increased being close to the vine. Um, so I think we've got to help and nurture people in that place. You say that churches and Christian organizations that have been overtaken by chronic anxiety will resist growth. As soon as I read that, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense, but I'd never thought of that before. Mm. How does that dynamic play out, Mark? Like what's underneath it? I mean, there's a book that um, a friend um, recommended to me recently called Leadership on the Line by Hefe Sendlinski. And it's not a Christian book. But it's so interesting that it just said something. I'm like, this is 100% felt. I see this everywhere. I've never heard a leadership book explain it. And basically their argument crystallized is a leadership is, is advocating for a positive program of change. People resist change because to change, you've got to lose something, sacrifice something, change hurts. So people will not attack your program of positive change. They'll attack you. So that's going to happen to you. You're going to get massive backlash. They will come to take you out. So you need a program to survive. That's essentially the book. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that's so brutal, but it's actually spot on. It's like, it's so real. And so people don't want to change. There are people who want control. There's a familiarity that we want to cling to. There's elements where our flesh, when we're challenged to grow in the, in the Christian schema, I think of becoming more Christ-like, when we're growing, we're dying to our flesh and our flesh resists. So any leader, and I think so many young leaders, whether it's the training they've had, seminary, denomination, the internet, has, has not prepared them for the backlash and pain that comes when you advocate for positive change. In fact, the model of leadership they've been given is one of celebrity that people are going to love you. You're going to be known. It's going to be wonderful. <laughs> What they're not being told is that those closest to you and those around you and the crowd will have all backlash against you because they don't want to change. So I think that that sense what, you know, if you bring that together with sort of what Friedman is realizing is that change is is having this non-anxious presence in the face of continual backlash. Um, and, you know, and that's what I say in my book. My sort of critique a little bit of Friedman is that I don't think we can do that without the presence of God. Yeah. So, so break that down a little bit more, because I think that's right. I've seen that a million times where it's like, I'm not going to attack your idea, I'm going to attack you. And so many leaders in that field feel it happens to politicians, it happens to preachers, it happens to business leaders who are bringing about change. I mean, look at what's happening with Elon Musk and Twitter right now. And I'm not defending Elon Musk. I mean, that is a crazy show going on right now, but mm. so much criticism focused on him. I always thought, you know, do you really want to be a politician? Because basically every headline about you is going to be negative. And that's yes. leadership. Yes. So when you're in those, those crosshairs and when mm. the betrayal is personal, mm. you've mentioned turning to Jesus. Mm. What else? And maybe that's enough. Maybe that's it. But what else helps mm. in cultivating a non-anxious presence? Mm. I think that there is a, a distance that needs to happen. And, and what I mean by that is one of the things that the world says to us is you need to be close. You need to see me. That language of therapy, which can be really helpful in certain environments, also can be go beyond its bounds. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, the language, like the leader as therapist and, uh, you know, must see every person. And it's interesting. I hear so many people saying they're like, I left that church because I didn't feel seen. 
And part of me is like, I know pastors, like seriously, that person's got hundreds or thousands or whatever of people in that church. They're not going to see every person intimately, but there's almost this cultural value that the leader is the therapist. The leader is actually not the therapist. The leader can still be caring and compassionate, but there's not the intimacy sort of one-on-one. So leaders need to be pastorally caring for people and they need to be with the people, but then they also need to be, there needs to be a sense of distance where they can see the bigger picture of what's going on. And so people need to cultivate patterns of, you know, I, I talked, I've talked in some of my books about the idea of withdrawal return. There's this element that the leader is able to lead because they don't really, they aren't really part of the crowd and they feel even some of the sting of the crowd, which enables them to actually see some of the idols of the crowd. But then they, in love, return to the crowd. You know, it's like Jeremiah. Jeremiah is told, I think it's in Jeremiah 6, um, by God that he's to be a tester of men, that he's literally to create these tests for people to see. And, and sort of the Hebrew concept is that that's to be done through yard, through knowing, through being close. He's not a scientist at a distance, but he is going with God, seeing the bigger picture, and he's looking at everything from geopolitics. But then he's amongst the people. He's getting thrown in in, you know, sort of in the ground system toilets, you know, like in punishment. So I think that that distance is really key. Um, and I think having people as well who you can trust, um, perhaps that you aren't leading in the same way, that perhaps maybe outside is also helpful as well. Um, but I think an understanding and a yes, that you are willing to go forward in leadership, even when you're going to get backlash. And that at the starting point, counting the cost. I think could, I think there's been a panic because there's so few younger leaders coming through that we we sell it to them, yet we don't say, yeah, this is also going to hurt and, and, and this is going to possibly cost you everything. Yeah, okay, so let's drill down on that a little bit. Um, I've often thought about it. I don't think I've ever articulated it. So maybe I'm misreading you. We know each other, you know, somewhat well through the mm-hmm. podcast and leadership circles, but we haven't hung out a lot. But I'm I'm saying, okay, that might be easy for Mark because Mark has a whole bunch of books behind him. <laughs> All right, so wrong. Nah. But you got you got a whole lot of books behind you. You do a lot of reading. You kind of have your academic life, etc. I I am wired differently than most pastors. So I thought about why well, I was able to architect so much change. And this is a theory of mine. I recently redid my, my spiritual gifts inventory. And according to whatever we're using at our church right now, which you know I'm still a part of, uh, leadership is at the top, communication is at the top, faith is at the top. At the bottom, prayer, which apparently I've never gotten good at, even though I pray every day. And mercy is at the very bottom. And I look at that and I'm like, if you start taking shots at me, it just hurts less than a lot mm. of pastors I know. Mm. There are pastors I know who like, you know, I pull the arrow out and yeah. an hour, sometimes days later, but usually an hour later, I'm like, eh, okay. No, not all that is healthy. Some of that needs mm. more therapy. Um, mm. But like I've got an ability, a natural ability to distance myself from the mm. critics. It just doesn't hurt me the way it hurts other friends, because I'm wired differently. And I think that has made change and criticism easier for me. Now, have I lost sleep? Yes. Have I had friendships burn? Yes. Does it sting? Yeah. And some of them have stung for years. It took me a long time to get over it. But I think less so than most. Any advice for the pastor, and go into your own experience, who feels it more intensely? And maybe you do, Mark. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. I, if you can lay hands and pass that gift of, of not not having it feel on me, I'll take that gift in a moment. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. I'm a not moment. sure it's from God. Um, I'm not yeah, sure it's from no, God. No, no. Yeah, I don't yeah. know, Mark. Um, <laughs> I, I think you're right. There are people who who have a natural ability where it, it I don't know what it is, but you know, have, have articulated. I think what you said. You know, I, you know, I, I am the opposite of often what people think of me you know i i think a lot but i am i'm a feeler you know i'm, I'm an ex on ah. I, you know things i'm not that so you know a lot of a lot of my learning is actually to understand the world and understand people and and understand the pastoral situations that i'm in to learn something detached from people in reality is is not attractive to me um so you know it, it's difficult and and i think for me uh it's it's i know that what God's done in my life is so much that has come through the path of pain and suffering. 
And, you know, I think that um, pain and suffering leads people into greater spiritual authority. I wish it was different. I wish it was. Mm. And it's not everyone's particular. But, you know, I wrote a book called Facing Leviathan, which is really, this is that story. You know, it's that there, there are many leaders uh, who go through tremendously painful things. And I think often what they feel is um, they can't lead because they feel so strongly but I actually think they also have a real um, uh, contribution to make because they can relate to people who do feel that change. So there's a greater, I, I'm a bit hesitant at the word empathy, but you know, there's a greater compassion that they can have for people and they feel it. They feel it, it more deeply. Um, and, and I think like, you know, like on my sort of gift thing, that sort of the prophetic is um, sort of my, you know, I, I, I sort of feel very much the sort of, I identify very much with the sort of prophets in the Old Testament who sort of like saying things that are not always popular and then often that has a personal cost and so on. Um, so, you know, I, I think we need all sorts. But I think what I'm noticing is that younger generations um, haven't been taught to distance in the same way. It's not the world. They've been taught, you know, the way that they've been raised in schools is is being very aware of feelings and I think there, there's extremes. Um, but I think my little message to to anyone who's listening, who's like, you know, I, I, it, it hurts this season. That to me is a font to go deeper into to bring that before Jesus. And I think that the 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 benefit of that is greater spiritual authority. How do you distance yourself? Like, what are some when it is hurting? And and thank you for sharing that. Um, cause it would be easy from the outside looking in to go, oh, he's very cerebral, intellectual, maybe he doesn't feel it either, but you do, you feel it very intensely. So what do you do to like, not just give up and call it a day? How do, how do you distance yourself so you can go mm. back in and love? Mm. There's, a, there's a couple of, of key things. Um, again, the first thing on the other side of that wall, there's a room, which is now where Rebuilders is recorded. But before it was recorded, you know, I remember a period when we didn't have that all set up in there, um, and you know, there was there was a really tough challenge I was going through, and and the, there's a, a heater unit on the other side of there, and I remember one winter it was just like really tough season in ministry, and you know, I came in here at night, and a lot of that was literally laying on the floor, flat before God, just saying, just just take this, like, and it was really interesting, the intimacy that developed with him like that's the complete opposite <laughs> here's a great idea it was literally like i am laying on the floor before you um and, and i remember i heard this story about pope john paul ii where when he first went into the vatican he had this prayer chapel where he would pray and they couldn't find him for ages and they'd come in and they'd keep looking for him and every day like he's meant to be in prayer this guy's meant to be the pope he's not praying and then they realized that they couldn't see him because he was lying flat sort of as he prayed in the sort of presence of God. And I remember reading that and then thought, that's all I can do at this moment. Like I'm just going to lay flat in front of God and sort of just cry out to me in the pain. I think the second thing is processing it with, with wise people. I, you know, I have a, I have a leadership coach and a lot of that is not just like, Hey Mark, here's an idea of how you can lead. A lot of that is me processing in the right place. I think a lot of younger pastors, um, because they've not got a place to do that, can do that online. They can do that in the pulpit. There's a sense where you need to be real, but also you need to process and then recognize what in my journey and what in the pain I've gone through is actually to use to be taught. What's actually for me in here it, it is really key. And then I think time is a distancer. Time is a distancer. There is a sense where when you keep walking, it's like grief. Grief is is everywhere and it just becomes a little bit less and a little bit less and it's going to return. But there's a sense that I think as you go through things, and I think that's why I believe in like there's a grit and determination in me despite all my feelingsness. Like I'm a very determined person. Um, and part of that is I think a commitment to God because you know, Christ changed my life and I want to follow him. So I'm committed to keep going, even when it's horrendous. There's been many times when I just want to walk away, but I think that mm -hmm. commitment to him, and I realize that the more committed I am, the greater distance I get from pain I've gone through and the closer I get to him as I become more like him. Hmm. I think that kind of leads into one insight. I'm going to read this quote. It says, this is from a non-anxious presence. A worrisome introspection became normative as believers became more focused on their inner worlds than a world to be reached with the gospel. 
I think pain can some, and I've, you know, it's not like I never feel pain. There have been intensely painful seasons. I just think I feel it less. Mm -hmm. But where I became almost entirely self-focused. Andy yeah. Stanley told me once, he goes, pain is selfish. Mm -hmm. Drop a cinder block on your toe and see what you're thinking about. You're only thinking about that toe. And I think it's so true. When you're in pain, how do you find the strength or what are some keys to finding the strength to stay outward focused mm. and not be totally self-focused? Mm. Well, I think, I think the, the short answer is vision. And, and we've got a vision, you know, to be the people of God, to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, you know, to, to, to live the kingdom, bring, bring us of justice and mercy. And so I think that that's, that's the vision. What I have noticed, so like, you know, I've been a big, big advocate of practices and habits and, and really fascinated by them. They've had a huge effect on me. There's something we advocate for in our church. I did notice when, when the pandemic happened, there was this reduction in our worlds. Um, but there was also a temptation because we couldn't control the outside world. The world had told us that but you can control the world. The world's your playground. It's your destiny. You know, you can almost rearrange the universe according to your, your will. Pandemic showed us we couldn't. Like, like there was a whole bunch of stuff we were out of control and the economy and the environment and all that is continuing to show us that. So the danger is then we just control our inner worlds. So I just create this little cachet of practices. And, and what happens then is vision is reduced. Um, you know, I was, I was at a, a conference recently uh, in, in, in Europe and, um, you know, I was, I was standing there and, and I was in worship and, and there was different people sort of who were, you know, praying at the front and giving some different words. And I just had this, this sense. I remember I'd, I'd read um, Reese Howe's Intercessor book and, um, you know, about how in World War II he was like interceding against Hitler. And, you know, I just read and I'd just flown from Australia and I'd flown over the Black Sea the day that there were intelligence reports that Putin may drop a tactical nuke over the Black Sea. And I remember just thinking, well, you know, like we're on the precipice here. And I remember thinking, what if this is 1939? <laughs> and so I'm, I'm in this conference and I, and I felt this like this thing of like, you're, you're thinking too small. Why do you look back and go, oh, it's great that Reese House prayed and, you know, we should have a practice of prayer. So over my church, over on Tuesday, have a practice of prayer. And I just felt like this big vision to like, don't just look back at him and celebrate what he did in the past. Why are you not doing this now? And I felt this mm. tremendous urge to actually go to the front and say to the, the people who ran that session, we need to pray that war will actually be averted and we need to cry for peace now. Uh, and like, again, so I'm like, oh, this is going to sound crazy, you know, be in control. But I remember that I'll just think about this for like 30 seconds before I go ahead with this. I close my eyes and before I know it, I'm walking down to the front, you know, and I went and they said, share this. And yeah, and I'm in this hall with people from all over the world crying out for peace in, in Ukraine. It was an incredible moment. And for me, that's the sort of faith we need for this moment. Yes, we do need the habits and, 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 and we need, you know, to practice them. But we also need to still have the vision that what God is using those habits for is to shape us in Christ likeness. And Christ came to save the world and he partners with us in, in that project. And, and we need to have a big vision at this point in time. You know, and the world's out of control. We need to be more engaged with the world now than ever before. That, that's why God has put us here. Hmm. On your podcast, uh, I'm sure you see a lot of mistakes that leaders are making right now, but there was one you really focused in on. Can you go through some of the mistakes that leaders, that you see leaders making right now? Yeah. I think one of the big ones, and, and what we captured on a podcast recently, and, it, and it almost there's a bunch of subcategories you could boil under this, but the summation is so many leaders make technical solutions. So, for example, everything's changing. So, what's the size worship hall I need? Um, how many services should we do? How many people should I employ? Um, what sort of sermons should I be preaching at this moment? What, what book of the Bible should, you know, like these are all things and they're important. I have to make these decisions all the time. So I don't want to slate them or say that there's something wrong. But in periods of change, what you realize is that if you just keep making technical solutions, often technical solutions are suited to the previous era. If we're in a gray zone, there's no markers, there's no rules. We don't know what the world looks like in six months. Um, we need to learn to start making adaptive leadership decisions, adaptive leadership decisions where you're like, I don't know the playbook. A technical solution is um, my computer breaks down. Give me the manual 
there's a whole bunch of engineers and scientists that work out how to build this thing. I just have to repeat what they did in the past to move towards flourishing. In a gray zone world where everything's up in the air and chaotic, some of the answers that people listening to this need to make in their churches have not been discovered yet. <laughs> so this is where we're almost being forced back to bring this full circle back to civilizational decline. We've been forced into, we want to be managers continuing the tradition when actually we're being forced by reality to be pioneers. So what that means is that says to your people, hey, we're going to head in this direction. I don't know where it's going. And we don't have all the answers yet, but we're going to pray that God leads us and that we discover answers as we go. Now, leaders do not like to say that because a lot of leaders' authority comes from their technical proficiency. Now, when everything <laughs> changes, when everything changes, your authority comes from your openness to what the Spirit is doing, your openness to looking at the environment and being adaptive. So I think we're moving from a world of technical ability to adaptive nous. Hmm. Yeah, that's a really good word because you're basically refining a system that isn't working anymore or you're asking the wrong question. That makes sense. We, we've hinted at this um, throughout the conversation, but what does the modern church today have to learn from the historic church? And what does the Western church have to learn from the non-Western church? Yes. Um, I, I think that there is... History doesn't repeat it rhymes, and I see history as a incredible repository of inspiring characters and uh, stories, and it's a testament that at really dark times, God turns up and does a new thing. Um, just taking carte, carte blanche so technical solutions from the past is not what is going to be the solution for the future as well. So I want to make that distinction. So I think there's so much we can learn. But the big thing is that I think what I've learned from history is that at the exact at the moment, you know, I, I think of the Dark Ages, you know, again, I was just in Ireland a few weeks ago, and Ireland is this country on the edge of the Atlantic. And when Europe re-paganized, like a lot of people forget that, the gospel came through and then it, a lot of the tribes in Northern Europe re-paganized and went back as the Roman world fell and it went into kind of gray zone of the Dark Ages that... These people in Ireland, through prayer, through mission, re-evangelize Europe. That's a story I want to hear, I want to tell. I tell that story. Every time I go to Ireland, I'm like, these cities uh, were literally one guy praying and order and flourishing coming around that, and these cities grew out of it. Um, you know, that's my prayer for Ireland again, but also that's that's an inspiration. So number one, but also I'm not going to now go out into, into the central part of my state in the middle of nowhere and build a little hut with stones of prayer and reenact the technical solution of an Irish monk from the Dark Ages. Uh, you know, I want to take that inspiration, but I want to pray what the Holy Spirit's doing in, in, in the next um, um, season. I think what we can learn, you know, we can romanticize the non-Western church. It also has lots of problems. <laughs> you know? um, but what I, what I have learned from, you know, as I've spoken to particularly people in the persecuted church, is the question that asked me, are you willing to be culturally on the edge? Are you willing to be marginalized? And there's also marginalized communities in the Western church as well. Uh, you know, I think, I think of the testament, you know, of, of communities which have experienced racism um, for many years, you know, who are part of the Western church, who have had an experience of marginalization, who I think we can learn from in the next season of, well, what does it look like when you don't have believers on the hands of the power control of the Overton window? But I think it, it's learning you know, I think much of the Western church has been bloated. It has maybe has had too much money. Maybe it's had too much bureaucracy and management. And actually what we can learn, I think, is God still turns up with very few resources, very few programs, and God turns up in a big way when you're just going after the presence of God and who God is. That's the good news I think the church outside of the West can tell us. I think that that's an inspiration for us as we move into the next season. And that's why I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful for what God's going to do. Is it 10 years? When is it? I don't know, but I'm actually hopeful. Yeah. And on that note, I, I want to think about what you see a decade from now. I know the emerging era hasn't emerged. I know we don't mm -hmm. know 100% what's at ahead mm -hmm. other than instability. But, you know, from what you can see, where do you think the Western church will be a decade from now? Uh, and there's probably like a shell of what was left. And then where are the seeds 
of new birth, new hope, and what will the future church look like in that context, Mark? Mm-hmm. I think one of the big things, so there's all the different cultural stuff that we've spoken about. I hinted at it early, but I think the big thing in 10 years, which people aren't recognize, reckoning, is that if you go to any Western church, you go to a, a church in Canada, the United Kingdom, uh, Northern Europe, New Zealand, Australia, whatever, America, the predominant largest group is people who are in the baby boomer generation who are probably in their 70s, and that generation is going to pass. They're either going to be less involved or they're going to literally pass. And we overwhelmingly people have not prepared for that. So the church just demographically, even if there's less people moving to secularism, is going to significantly shrink. And there is a battle for the next generation. And it's no longer a battle for the next generation of, is the church going to have contemporary enough forms to engage them? It, uh, almost that feels so redundant now. You know, my belief is that there is, there is. You know, I, I'm, I'm about to, you know, we've got our Advent series coming up. And, and I, I think I'm going to preach one of the least Christmassy nostalgic sermons ever, which is Herod coming after the next generation. And, you know, I think there's something in that. You know, I, I feel that, the powers and principalities of our day is coming after the next generation in incredible ways. Why? Because I think the enemy sees the seeds. And I think we're going to see probably a smaller church, but I think it's going to be a more devoted church. Um, there's going to be all kinds of crazy stuff. We're going to have crazy syncretism. There's all going to be stuff happen, but that's not what I'm looking at. What my hope is, is and what, I'm, what I want to build towards is hopefully, you know, in, in 10 years, maybe no one remembers who I am, but there'll be a bunch of people who I'm pouring into now who – Almost, I look, I look, we'll look back at the church of the 90s and the 2000s and go, what were those guys doing? They were just wasting time. Who are devoted in prayer, devoted in mission. And I think those seeds are people. I think those seeds are people. I think there are people listening to this now or this we passed on to someone and go, I think this is you. You know, some of these people are 14 now. Some are, some are 28. But they have this hunger for renewal. They're complete outliers in their generation and they are willing to pay the high cost to get the high growth spiritually that God is going to ask of the church in the West in the next season. And it's not the size of the church. It's the size of the devotion in the seed, in the remnant in the church. And that's why I'm hopeful because, you know, I see that. You know, I was, I was at a conference recently, and it was interesting. Like The conference was going well, and then I went outside, and there was like a youth section and, and just hearing the praises and hearing the hunger coming from this, this, this youth praising, I thought that, that's what our hope's going to be. Our hope's obviously in Jesus, but it's in Jesus using that next generation. So I think that's, that's the picture I see, a smaller, but I think a stronger, more devoted church, which is the seed of renewal. Anything else you want to share with us? Man, it's been fascinating as always. Oh, just like be a seed seeker. <laughs> like <laughs> a, 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 any any leader here, like who, like I reckon you've got one of those people in your church. How are you going to pour into that person, not the anxious baying crowd? Hmm. Hmm. Mark, absolutely fascinating. The book is called A Non-Anxious Presence, uh, How a Changing and Complex World Will Create a Remnant of Renewed Christian leaders uh, love the book. People can find you at Rebuilders Podcast. Make sure you check that out. Where else are you showing up online these days, Mark? Uh, primarily on Rebuilders. I mean, I've, I have an Instagram. I've got Twitter. I'm, I'm a little bit negligent at times. <laughs> so I, try, I try and push it all into, into Rebuilders. It's probably the best place. Uh, it's such a, such a good show. Anyway, thank you so much, Mark. Until next time. So appreciate you. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It's been fantastic. There's a new movement happening in the country to reclaim the promise of Jesus' unconditional love and grace and to see his church rise above the culture war. He gets us, hopes to give it a voice. The biggest faith campaign in history, He Gets Us invites a rapidly growing audience from spiritual explorers to like-minded Christians to reconsider the radical life of Jesus. Whether people believe Jesus was God or just a man, they're invited to consider his example for themselves.